Okay, folks, everyone's favorite topic, the vasculitides. <laughs> These are a pain in the butt on step one, but fortunately, step two and step three, you really just need to have a general idea of each of these. We're not going to be looking at any pathology here. Um, so hopefully you remember a good amount from step one um, and you can apply this then to a clinical context because the questions that you get on step two and step three are going to be fairly straightforward, especially step three. Um, you will not, uh, almost certainly will not get uh, one of these in CCS. Um, so it helps to have an idea of how these compare and I'm going to try to break it down to you, break it down for you so that um you know, it's, it's easier to understand the difference between these, but they're very difficult from a diagnostic standpoint. Um, often these patients are going to be diagnosed by a rheumatologist, not primary care doc. So let's get into it. If you haven't had a chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely subscribe to my channel and you will get notifications um, when I put more and more videos up, which I try to do multiple times per week. All right, so let's just do a quick overview of the vasculitides. So what is what is this? At its fundamental level, it is inflammation of the vessels, usually the arteries, and it is autoimmune in origin. Uh, there's a range of symptoms depending on which vasculitis you're dealing with, uh, but there are some similar features that you'll run into with most of them, particularly when we're talking about the small and medium vessels, which we're doing in this talk. So. Most of the time, these patients present with fever, pain, and a rash. Wow, isn't that specific? <laughs> okay, so the rash will be palpable purpura. It could be maculopapular. They may have little nodules. Um, the, they'll have constitutional symptoms, so a fever, fatigue, malaise, weight loss, myalgias, arthralgias. And then if you get labs, you'll see typical signs of inflammation. So a normocytic anemia, thrombocytosis, remember that's an acute phase reactant, platelets, and elevated sed rate. Biopsy is always the most accurate test to diagnose vasculitis. The therapy of choice usually involves a corticosteroid and sometimes an adjunctive cytotoxic like methotrexate or cyclophosphamide, something like that. But pretty much always in vasculitis, we are giving a steroid like prednisone. All right, so we're going to talk about these here. So there's four of them, and then we will save the large vessel vasculitides for another talk. All right, so let's start out with GPA, formerly called Wegner's. I learned this as Wegner's, so it's very difficult for me to change, but um, it is GPA now, granulomatosis with polyangitis. So the thing that makes GPA or Wegner's stand, stand out is that it really, really, really has a predilection for the upper respiratory tract. So look for a history of repeated sinus infections, chronic sinusitis. This is because you get inflammation there and it disturbs the integrity of the tissue so you're more likely to get an infection. So sinus pain, also nasal stuff. So uh, stuffy nose, nasal discharge, bloody nose. So just lots of upper respiratory tract stuff going on. And one of the more salient features uh, that may be told to you, although it's kind of a giveaway, is septal perforation and presumably not a cocaine user, right? Now, they can also have lower respiratory tract symptoms like shortness of breath, cough, hemoptysis, dyspnea, abnormal lung sounds. That can be dif difficult to distinguish from, you know, the pneumonias and stuff like that. So when you got a patient coming in with wheezing or difficulty breathing, something like that, you're going to get a chest x-ray. Glomerulonephritis, Wegner's, um, it commonly involves the kidneys. Um, so usually this is subclinical. They're not going to have symptoms of renal failure, but if you were to get a urinalysis, you may see some abnormalities, even though it's not uh, clinical yet. Uh, most patients who have undiagnosed Wagner's have a history of chronic sinusitis, and maybe they've even seen an ENT and they just have not been able to get it under control. So again, I stress to you, look for those respiratory symptoms along with a subclinical glomerulonephritis. Uh, the 
most common presenting complaint, like I said, is uh, refractory chronic sinusitis. Did I say? Yeah. Okay, I did put that on there. Um, they can also get this saddle nose deformity, which I'll show you a picture of. That's fairly um, typical for, for Wegner's. Um, and then a lot of these other things that we associate with arteritis. Now, the best initial test uh, when you suspect an arteritis is to order all of the ANAs and ANCAs, um, all those autoantibodies uh, that, uh, that you may uh, suspect. Um, so we're going to see as we go through these that there are certain autoantibodies that are prevalent uh, with these various arteritides. So the best initial test when you suspect Wegner's is a C anca, and you can think of it as Wegner's. That's why I really wish they hadn't changed the name, but there were good reasons, I will admit. Uh, the most accurate test is a renal biopsy because this has such a predilection for the kidneys. This is a saddle nose deformity, pretty obvious. Collapse of the nasal bridge. And you can see it here as well. This is a little less dramatic, but you can see that little indentation. You can see it here too, and well, there. Okay. And then you can get a nasal septum perforation. So keep an eye out for that. This is normal here, and then this is the perforation. This rash is typical of most vasculitides, so it's very nonspecific. All right, so as I said, C. anca, you should definitely get it. The lungs will always be involved, even if the patient's asymptomatic. Um, so you, a chest x-ray will be helpful for you, although they may not have pulmonary symptoms at the time of presentation. The treatment is prednisone and rituximab. All right, so eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. Used to be called churg strauss now we call it EGPA. So this is similar to, uh, in, in many respects, to Wegner's. Um, I can't get out of the habit of calling it that, folks. I'm sorry. Uh, it's similar to GPA. It's eGPA. And the thing that makes this stand out is that these patients always have asthma, either diagnosed or a history, and eosinophilia. So if you get that CBC, you'll see eosinophilia. Uh, so it does share some features of both uh, Wegner's and polyarteritis nodosa, but the patient with Churg Strauss or EGPA always has asthma. So these are some similarities to GPA and to polyarteritis nodosa, which we'll talk about. Some unique things though, like I said, they always have some sort of asthma, reactive airway sy uh, syndrome, they always have eosinophilia, and if you were to get a biopsy, it would show eosinophils in the granulomas. So you still have granulomas, but they're eosinophilic. Um, so this is the triad, vasculitis, asthma, and eosinophilia. Look for a history of asthma and recurrent sinusitis. Uh, now, these patients have, uh, they're less likely to get that recurrent sinusitis compared to Wegner's, but uh, it still happens. Uh, but typically, it's a lot less dramatic, so they're not going to get that saddle nose deformity and perforation and stuff. Um, there are various other symptoms, but uh, it's important that you uh, understand that if you don't have any pulmonary symptoms, that points more to polyarteritis nodosa, which we'll talk about. Um, so there are a variety of abnormalities on lab that really don't distinguish it from the other uh, vasculitides. Uh, the big one is P. anca will be positive. Remember with Wagner's, it's C. anca. With eosinophilic GPA or Churg Strauss, it's P. anca. Now, in the presence of clinical suspicion, the best initial diagnostic step is, um, I suppose, after you get your labs, is a biopsy of an infected area. And fortunately, um, if you have a patient with a rash, you can just do that. Okay, just biopsy the rash. Uh, this is the ACR criteria for Churg Strauss. So, um, you know, if you want to memorize this, you can, but I wouldn't. Just get the general idea. Vasculitis with asthma is eGPA. All right, so eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis or Churg Strauss, the treatment is prednisone alone. So prednisone alone is typically sufficient. If that's not enough, there is a new drug called mepolizumab or Nucala. It's still uh, on patent, so um, I wouldn't expect to be asked about that on your exam. So just know for Churg Strauss or EGPA, it's prednisone alone. 
Okay, microscopic polyangiitis is uh, also a um, autoimmune disease of the small vessels, and it also, similar to uh, Churchrouse, is implicated by Pianca. Now, it can involve any organ system, uh, but usually it's going to be affecting the skin, lungs, neuromuscular system, and the kidneys. It's very, very, very similar to Wegner's. Okay, the big difference is with microscopic polyangiitis, it's going to be a P anca as opposed to a C anca and no upper respiratory tract symptoms. So no sinusitis, no nosebleeds, no septal perforation, uh, but otherwise it's very similar to Wegner's. Um, so they may be more likely to have muscle aches and pains because this can affect the muscles directly, but that's difficult because these vasculitides in general, um, the small and medium vessels, um, they cause these constitutional myalgias um, all the time. So that can be difficult to tease out. Uh, but like I said, look for a, sign, a, a patient that looks like Wegner's, but they don't have a C anca and they don't have upper respiratory tract symptoms. The best initial test would be to get an anca, and you would see a P anca. I would order a C anca and P anca at the same time, by the way. And then the most accurate test is a biopsy. The, uh, so the, the treatment here is the same as Wegner's, um, and that makes sense because it's a very similar presentation, very similar organs are, uh, are affected. So we use prednisone and rituximab. Polyarteritis nodosa is uh, another vasculitis that primarily affects the medium vessels. So what does that mean? What kind of vessels do we have in our lungs? They're tiny, tiny, tiny little vessels. So because it's a medium vasculitis, it spares the lungs. It can affect any organ system though, but the lungs are typically spared and that's what makes this one fairly unique. Um, so most commonly it's the skin, kidneys, nerves, and GI tract that's involved, and that's a big one because some of these symptoms uh, will be GI in nature. It is uniquely associated with viral hepatitis, particularly hepatitis B. So if you've got a patient who has confirmed polyarteritis nodosa or you suspect it, get hepatitis panels. Uh, in addition to the general vasculitis features that we talked about, abdominal pain is a big one. But lots of medium-sized vessels in your gut. And there could be renal involvement, hypertension, testicular involvement, pericarditis. All of those are fairly common. Now, another thing that stands out with polyarteritis nodosa. Yes, it can affect the kidneys. But remember, medium vessels, not small vessels. So it is not going to cause glomerulonephritis. What kind of vessels do we have in our glomerulus? Little tiny eensy weensy vessels. Okay, so because this is limited to the medium-sized vessels, yes, we can get renal insufficiency, but we are not going to have the glomerulonephritis because those vessels are just simply too small. All right, so if you were to get a urinalysis, it would be clean, and that's another thing that makes us stand out. Uh, so the best uh, initial test is an abdominal vessel angiogram. Again, medium-sized vessels. Where do you have a lot of them? In your gut. The most accurate test is going to be some sort of biopsy. Um, now, you can get livido reticularis in PAN, but this is nonspecific. And then you can get this rash. So this isn't a PAN patient, but this is very similar to the rash you'll see in other small and medium vesicle, vessel vasculitides. You can also get these nodules, too. And then this is the criteria for PAN. Again, I would not recommend memorizing this. Just know what makes each one different. Know that there are also general symptoms as well. Okay, so the treatment for polyarteritis nodosa is prednisone and cyclophosphamide. Now, it used to be that we gave prednisone and cyclophosphamide to the, uh, for the other three as well. So it was very easy management. You just went with those two. But now uh, for Wagner's and for microscopic polyangiitis, we give prednisone and rituximab. And for Churg-Strauss, we give prednisone only. However, for polyarteritis nodosa, we give prednisone and cyclophosphamide. We want to avoid cyclophosphamide in general because it really hits your immune system. It can cause bladder issues. Um, so we try to avoid it, but here we do use cyclophosphamide. The exception is if the patient has hep B. If the patient has hep B, 
instead of cyclophosphamide, we will give a hep B drug like lamivudine or uh, something like that, all right? Now, what's an adverse effect of cyclophosphamide? Kind of alluded to this, hemorrhagic cystitis, okay? Now, what additional drug do we need to give a patient who's on cyclophosphamide as a prophylaxis? Okay, you're probably thinking mesna, right? Besides that. So remember I said cyclophosphamide hits your immune system. And so we need to prevent the development of something we usually associate with something else called PCP pneumonia. Okay, we usually worry about that in HIV patients, but these patients are immunosuppressed as well. And what do we give for PCP prophylaxis in HIV patients? Trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, okay? Go back and watch my opportunistic infections videos if you haven't watched that yet, because you'll want to know prophylaxis for uh, HIV AIDS. And then this is basically everything we went through all on one slide.